I always seem to have trouble with, uh, with the computers and the slideshows and, and these types of things, which I think has made people who go over bridges and live in tall buildings very happy that I stayed as an historiologist and a student of ancient history and didn't go into engineering. <laughs> um, let me begin, as we should all begin, by thanking uh, Halver and, and Miriam. Um, we talk about community and family. My early days at the Hebrew University really coincide with their early days. Together, in a way, uh, we grew up here in the Rothberg International School and in the whole issue of Bible study and in international studies. And I'm very proud to be considered part of their family. And I'm very proud to have the honor of speaking to, um, in honor of the Home for Bible Translators in the Judean Hills, which you see here. Um, over the years, I've spoken many times, both here at the Rothberg School on the Mount Scopus campus and in Mivaseret Zion, about the impact of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires and the Assyrian and Babylonian literary traditions on the Bible and its world. Um, today, I've been asked to give a short version of a lecture I have given many, many times, namely a study of Sennacherib's campaign to the west of 701 BCE which culminated with the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem. Some of you who are HBT alumni may have even heard a full exposition of this topic, which I typically give either over one hour or sometimes even over a pair of lectures with a break in between. I will do my best to limit myself to the 20, 25 minutes or so that we have here so that we can all get to this, our most welcome cup of coffee, which awaits us. <laughs> So where to begin then? Well, in my longer lectures, I tend to begin with Abraham. But today, we'll go a little bit before 701 in Sennacherib, back to the 720s, to the time of 2 Kings 17, 22, 23, to the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel and the exile of the 10 lost tribes. The children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and they departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he spoke by the hand of all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away out of their land to Assyria and to this day. Thus, by 701 BC, BCE, the southern kingdom of Judah stood alone with its capital in Jerusalem. And upon this remnant rested the full burden of the future of Judean and Jewish history what would eventually become the building of the diaspora, which we now know much more from a series of tablets or archive of tablets that have been only published and displayed this year from the town of Al Yehudu, Judah town, New Jerusalem, on Babylonian soil, where we see here, for example, the earliest evidence we have for Hebrew, surviving evidence we have for Hebrew writing on foreign soil and a translation of the name of a Judean in Babylonia back into native Hebrew in first millennium script. This piece here, Shalom Yahu. From here, anyway, not from there, but, oh, I guess from here, sorry. From here, from the Babylonian exile, the historical line continues. The return to Zion of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Maccabean revolt, the destruction of the Second Temple, the rise of Christianity, the writing of the Mishnah and the Talmud, the rise of the modern Zionist movement, the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, and then the establishment of the Home for Bible Translators 20 years ago. <laughs> All these are important events. But for today, given our limitations of time and space and context, let's talk about 701. And we'll talk about 701 from three sets of sources. Ancient Assyrian historical sources, the royal annals and inscriptions of Sargon II of Assyria and Sennacherib himself. Second, the biblical historical sources, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, with also a bit of archaeological evidence and art historical evidence from both the land of Israel and from the Assyrians. 
In this, our main piece of evidence will be the famous Assyrian Lachish tablet, now on display in the British Museum, but originally at Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh, but today in Jerusalem we have duplicates or replicas of at least parts of these panels in both the Arche Institute of Archaeology here on Mount Scopus and in the Israel Museum. Well, as many of you know, these panels from the palace of Sennacherib celebrate Sennacherib's great victory over the city of Lachish in the Shvela. Not his victory over Jerusalem, but his victory of, over Lachish. This is an anomaly, since Lachish obviously was not the capital city. To understand why this is so and why this is so important to us today, we need to go back to 705. In 705 BCE, Sargon II, king of Assyria, died in battle on the northern frontier of the Assyrian Empire. Worse than that, his body was not recovered by the Assyrian forces. And so there were many in the Assyrian Empire who saw this as a sign that the gods had abandoned the Assyrian kings. This led to revolts, coordinated revolt throughout the Assyrian Empire from east to west with the allies of Babylon and at this time Jerusalem, an ally of Babylonia, rising in tandem against their Assyrian overlords. 705, 704, 703, 702. The Assyrians dealt with the Babylonians and resubjugated the southern half of Mesopotamia. By 701, the east had been dealt with. It was time to turn Assyria's attentions to the west. In the west, Hezekiah, king of Judah, had already made preparations for a possible possibility of an Assyrian invasion. The memory of the fall of the northern kingdom, of course, set firmly in his mind. Within Jerusalem, we know that Hezekiah built new fortifications, the most important of which is the broad wall. If we talk about context, the broad wall for me is the key moment in Jewish history. Without the broad wall, we wouldn't be sitting here today. There would be no Hebrew there would need be no Bible, and we'll see why this is so. The other important, um, another important archaeological manifestation of the period is the growth of the city of Jerusalem. In terms of territory, Jerusalem grows, the, the walled city grows by four, and we now really have a situation of a large capital with all the eggs in one basket. Jerusalem is now the central core without which it would be most likely, again, that we would not be here. There would be no home for Bible translators. Last but not least, many of you are familiar with Hezekiah's water tunnel, the Sil Sil Silwan, Silom, that was built by Hezekiah. And this, too, dates to our period. In any case, all these preparations worked. Sargon II and then Sennacherib were never able to take Jerusalem and Judah. Not in 721 when the northern kingdom fell, not during the revolutions of the west of 714 to 712, and certainly not in 701 when Lachish and many of the other, in fact most of the other cities and villages and towns of Judah did fall. So now let's take a look at Lachish. Lachish, again, for those of you not familiar with the geography of the country, is located on, in the Shvela, the area of low hills which stand between the mountains of the Judean heartland and the coastal plain. Lachish stands, the ruins of Lachish stand near the modern development town of Kiryat Gat, approximately midway between Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and Beersheba. Excavations took place there beginning in the 1930s with British archaeology, with the British archaeological team. And here we can see the Tel of Lachish. Israel spons Israeli sponsored archaeologists began work there in the 60s. They uncovered a number of levels of occupation, which I talk about in the much longer forms of this lecture. But for our purposes today, 
we're only interested in level three, which comes to an abrupt end during our period when the entire city is destroyed by fire. The historical background to this fire is quite clear. It is, it is the destruction level of the Assyrian invasion of 701. For example, 2 Kings 18.13 reports, Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fortified cities and took them. While the annals of Sennacherib himself report that Sennacherib and his army campaigned in the west in the third year of his reign, 701, and was victorious over all his enemies, including Tyre, Sidon, Byblos, Ashton, Moab, Amnon, and Ashkelon. So too, Sennacherib reports victory over Hezekiah in his inscriptions. I now give you the translation of these inscriptions, or parts of these inscriptions, from Anchor Bible Translation, 2 Kings, by my teacher, Chaim Tadmor Zikranol the founder of Assyriology at the Hebrew University, and my dear colleague, Mordechai Kogan. As for Hezekiah the Judean, who had not submitted to my yoke, I besieged 46 of his fortified walled cities and surrounding small towns, which were without number. Using packed down ramps and by applying battering rams, infantry attacks by mines, breaches, and siege machines, I conquered them. I took out 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, cattle, and sheep without number, and counted them as spoil. Hezekiah himself, I locked him up within Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthworks and made it unthinkable, an ikibu, for him to exit by the city gate. His cities which I despoiled, I cut off from his land and gave them to Mitinti, king of Ashtod, Padi, king of Ekron, and Silibel, king of Gaza, and thus diminished his land. I opposed upon him, in addition to the former tribute, yearly payment of dues and gifts for my lordship. <coughs> Notice what's missing here. As for Hezekiah the Jew, himself, I locked him up within Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. But there is no discussion of the actual conquest of Jerusalem. Yet, um, booty and tribute are sent. He, Hezekiah, was overwhelmed by the awesome splendor of my lordship and sent me after my departure to Nineveh, my royal city, his elite troops and best soldiers, which he had brought into Jerusalem as reinforcements with 30 talents of gold, 800 talents of silver, choice antimony, large blocks of carnelian, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. He also dispatched his personal messenger to deliver the tribute and do obeisance. Well, again, Jerusalem does not fall, and Hezekiah remains in power to send his personal messenger. Another Assyrian witness to the Sennacherib's campaign to Judah may directly relate to this anomaly. This is the well-known and aforementioned Lachish tablet, again, one of the masterpieces of Assyrian art a series of wall panels on display in the British Museum, originally from Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh. They look something like this. They, they are, are just too long and too extensive to be rendered in an easily visible photograph. But here now, I'll give you some detail. Here, a drawing of the Assyrian armies marching up the siege ramp against the city of Lachish and exiles going off in captivity afterwards in sort of this time bubble that happens on this, in Assyrian art. Here again, we see the exiles going off into exile while the Assyrian soldiers move up the ramp. The archers against the backdrop of the flora and fauna of the land of Israel. The heat of battle, we can see the the, the, um, the slingshots and um, the fire, and here we see the slingshot core of the Assyrian army on their attack. On the other side, we see the aftermath of the battle. We see Judeans going into exile, we see Assyrian soldiers carrying off the riches of Lachish, and we also see King Sennacherib sitting on his throne looking back at the scene. Sennacherib 
sits on his throne, and above him we have the inscription. Sennacherib, Sharkishati, Sharmat Ashuri, in a kusi nemedi ushibma, shalat mat, sorry, shalat urulakisu maharshu etik. Sennacherib, king of the universe, king of the land of Ashur, in his standing throne sat, and the booty of the city of Lachish passed before him, including the exiles. Yet, again, the Lachish tablet remains an anomaly, an enigma. Why do we not have a Jerusalem tablet? This would be as if, God forbid, the Soviet Union had conquered the United States, and I hope I'm not insulting anyone, but the display of this great victory in Moscow would have been a copy of the Akron, Ohio tablet, rather than that of Washington, D.C., or New York City. And the answer to this anom anomaly or enigma, of course, is found in the biblical text. 2 Kings 18.20, 2 Chronicles 29-32, and Isaiah 36-37, which all offer accounts of the events during Sennacherib's invasion of the West and Judah of 701. Unlike the Assyrian inscriptions, the Israelite, the Israelite Judean biblical accounts present the encounter of the Assyrians and the Judeans as a matter of theological rather than historical political importance. It is not the armies of Judah that defeat Sennacherib and keep Jerusalem safe, but rather it is God, the God of Israel himself, who does this in accordance with his promises to the children of Israel and the Davidic dynasty in particular. Second Kings 8. 2 Kings 18, and we'll follow the, for, for time purposes, we'll follow the narrative of 2 Kings, begins with an ascent of Hezekiah to the throne of Judah. We are told in 2 Kings 18, 5, 6, that he was unique among the kings of Judah in his loyalty to the God of Israel and the commandments of Moses. In 2 Kings 18, 17, we move on to the confrontation between Hezekiah and the Assyrians presumably that of 701, which opens with the king of Syria sending his armies and officials to the walls of Jerusalem, where the Rav Shakeh, a high official, the chief cupbearer of the Assyrian Empire, addresses Hezekiah and demanding his surrender of the city. The Rav Shakeh, the Rabbi Shaki, spoke to them, tell Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence of yours? Do you think that plans and arming for war can emerge from empty talk? Now, in whom have you put your trust that you rebelled against me? Here now, you put your trust in this splintered reed staff in Egypt, and so on. The speech of the Rav Shakeh, the Rabbi Shaki in Akkadian, as recorded in 2 Kings, presents a challenge to the theological basis of Hezekiah's rule. The Hebrew speaking, Rav Shakeh complains that Hezekiah has removed altars from all over Judah and centralized all worship at the temple in Jerusalem, apparently against the wishes of the Judean deity. If you tell me it is in God's name that, and it is God, that, it is in Jehovah our God that we put our trust, is he not the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed and then ordered throughout Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Well, the response to this is, no, that's not true. What is this? The response is quite interesting. The end of the Rav Shakeh speech is, now, was it without Jehovah that I marched against this place to destroy it? The God of Israel said to me, the king of Assyria, attack this country and destroy it. And what do the representatives of Judah say on the wall back? Eliakim son of Hilkiah, Shebna and Joah then said to the Rav Shakeh, please speak Aramaic with your servants, we understand it. Do not speak Judean with us within earshot of the people on the wall. Well, they, this man could have easily gone to the Bible translator's house. He could speak both Aramaic and Judean, i.e. the southern dialect of Hebrew. So who is this person? Who is this Rav Shakeh and what is his ideology? 
Well, we see here that he can speak Hebrew, and his ideology is that of the northern kingdom, that Jerusalem and the God of, the, that the God of Israel does not want Jerusalem to have monopoly of worship. We can only understand this text within the context of a greater understanding of the history of north and south in ancient Israel and a view of the land. At, when you travel through the land, one sees that Jerusalem is indeed in the center of the country, but it is in the northern part of Judah, and there is a whole area north of this in the, what was the northern kingdom of Israel and Samaria. But back to our story. So in the face of th this theological assault on the very core message of Judean theology, Hezekiah remains loyal to the God of <coughs> Jerusalem. And 2 Kings 19 opens with Hezekiah renting his clothes and covering himself in sackcloth, signs of mourning, and then going into the temple where God's answers to his prayers is given through the medium of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, speak thus to your master, thus says the God of Israel, do not be frightened by the words you have heard by which these attendants of the king of Assyria reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a report and return to his own country. I will strike him down by the sword in his own country. And after this, the Rav Shake opens with a second verbal attack on God and Hezekiah. Speak thus to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God deceive the one in whom you put your trust by thinking that Jerusalem will not be given over to the king of Assyria. Now surely you have heard that what the kings of Assyria did to all the lands, destroying them. And you, you will be saved? Question mark, huh? Did the gods of the nations save them among my ants, whom my ancestors destroyed, Gozan and Haran, Reseph and the Edenites of Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of Lair and Sepharvaim and Hena and Iwa? Hezekiah again goes to pray. Well, the stage is set. This is a direct attack on the ability of the God of Israel to show that Judah and Jerusalem are different than all the other countries and cities and temples who have been destroyed by the Assyrian Empire for the last 200 years. And so when we come to the end of 2 Kings 19, in what I think are the beautiful translation in some ways of the King James Bible, we find out that Jerusalem and Judah were saved. Thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, verse 32. He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast the bank against it, and so on. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went forth, and I'll have to do it by memory, I'm not going to fight the computer, went forth, and in that night, uh, the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred, fourscore, and so on, and so th the hand of God saved. <laughs> Jerusalem, but did not save my slideshow. In any case, according to the Judean biblical sources, the Assyrian army met disaster at the walls of Jerusalem. And it may very well be that Sennacherib and his scribes exaggerated the importance of the victory over Lachish to cover up this failure, the failure of destroying and conquering Jerusalem. As such, the Lachish tablet, precisely because it depicts an Assyrian victory at the secondary city of Lachish, in actuality documents the victory of Judah, Jerusalem, and the God of Israel. On a theological level, we have a Judean victory over Assyria that strengthened the tie between Judah, the house of David, and the national religion of Jerusalem. What did actually happen at the walls of Jerusalem? Well, we have three points of view. We have the Assyrian text, we have the biblical text, and we have the archeological evidence, which is more neutral. We have destruction levels at Lachish. We have no destruction level at Jerusalem. So I believe it's quite clear that God, history, however you want to understand it, save Jerusalem. 
God's victory over Sennacherib, at least as we're taught in our tradition, gave Judah breathing space, which in the final analysis allowed Judean culture to mature to a point where a hundred plus years later, with the fall of the city to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, new interpretations could be reached which would allow for Judean religion, Judean culture to develop into Jewish religion and Jewish culture to allow for all the events of Jewish history which happened afterwards, including, of course, the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. All this, however, is a story for a different time, perhaps for the next group of translators who are fortunate enough to be welcomed to the Bible Translator's House to look at the very broad and diverse topics of Bible study and biblical translation and biblical scholarship, which so represents this fine institution. Thank you. <laughs>